OK, so um, my name is Sebastian Koslowski. I do GOC development. And my talk is about what we've accomplished within the last year, meaning since the last GRCon. And so preparing for this, I kind of went digging into Gitlog and came up with this sort of statistics just to show you what's been going on. So we have accumulated quite a number of commits, which doesn't really mean that we did a lot. But <laughs> I just want to give a shout out to um, people who contributed to the tree within the last year. Most notably is Seth, who is co-maintaining um, GSE with me, is helping a lot and also committing to a lot of future work. <laughs> also, I want to give a shout out to Glenn, who is always coming up with cool ideas and actually implementing them himself. Now for the rest of the talk, I have like two sets of things I want to talk about. First, I want to walk you through some of the features we've added. And then in the second part, kind of go over and talk more about what, what Jonathan was talking about this morning, so the work we'll be doing for 3.8. This is a list of features I actually also pulled out of Git logs. Um, up here, um, are the ones that are going to go in depth a bit. So it's the variable explorer, which is kind of the most notable difference um, that we added. Then there's the embedded Python blocks and modules that I want to quickly show off. High block auto generation, custom run commands, and some changes to the block library. Other stuff that I just want to point out to is um, we did a complete docstring extraction rewrite that kind of uses a subprocess, so GSC doesn't sec fault anymore if you have a faulty installation. And it hopefully will help to pull in documentation that you have in Doxygen and then in the Python uh, wrapped blocks of yours. So if you have any problems with that part, please contact me, because it's kind of hard to test that in, on just my machine. Other things are you can set flow graph uh, theme files per flow graph. We have finally transparent uh, background in screenshots, not that pinkish shade. <laughs> um, Glenn has come up with some excellent block alignment tools. So if you're one of those guys who really needs neat chains of DSP blocks, you should check out the alignment submenu. Menu. And we've added a new port type specifically for unpacked bytes. So because those usually got confused. And when you connect them to packed bytes, weird things happen. So, to the variable explorer. This is a um, flow graph I borrowed from a colleague of mine. It has around 5.4 microbalance of complexity. And what you'll notice is a lot of screen real estate is, yeah, this goes on for like uh, a few more screens. So it's, I can zoom out later. Um, there's a lot of screen real estate lost due to the variable blocks. And the problem with that is it kind of clutters up and doesn't really help with the DSP part of what we're actually doing. And also, if I have a lot of variables, as we've seen this week already, I have a hard time finding one if I want to change one at times. So the solution we came up with is to add a new panel that is exclusively used to manage variables, thereby cleaning up the canvas. And what you can do with the panel is actually change IDs and values directly in this panel, which I've shown here on the right. But you can also delete and add simple import statements or even variable blocks. As you can see, the, the not simple variables, but the ones who actually have multiple uh, parameters, will require you to like, click here, and you get the, the usual dialog. And the only thing left to do is, and it's actually just a click away here on view, is to just hide these away, and then you can kind of have these neatly tucked away, and you can only concentrate on the DSP. Next thing uh, I want to mention is the embedded Python blocks. Now, this is something that it's, it's useful if you want to quickly try out some custom code. And you don't want to fire up Martool and start implementing C++. You ra rather like write it in Python. And with this feature, you can do it without even opening another tool. You just drop in a block. Um, it's the Python block. And then you open its properties and click on Open an Editor. And then you get a nice editor that'll let you enter the source code. And 
the cool thing about this is after you entered like a standard Gnoidio Python block in here and save it, the wrapper will automatically be updated. So I've put in two parameters here and they show up right here. I registered some ports and some messages and they will be added right here. So all of this is just parsing uh, the source code and it happens on the fly. As you type and save, stuff will get updated in the GUI. Having this, it wasn't far to do something else, which are the embedded Python modules. This is basically nothing that you could have done before. Like you write a file, a Python file, put it next to your flow graph, use an import statement, and make use of the module you're getting. With this, you can save all of that code directly in the GSC file. So it's the same with the block. It's just one file, and on generate, this file gets uh, extracted. And well, the use of this, of course, is like we usually, if we have uh, something and that needs a lot of config, we generate configuration objects that sometimes derive values from constants, generate filter tabs, and to have that all in one place within the flow graph is quite nice. Um, from there, you can pull it out like any other Python module value, constant, instance, whatever you prefer. All right, next one are the custom run commands, and this is somewhat tricky. So when you generate a flow graph, it spits out a Python file. If you click run, this is executed. Now often people wanna add something, um, ask me if I could add feature X, but not all of those are really wi widely applicable, so not everyone has use for those. So the reason I came up with this um, specific feature is once we have the code, you can mess with it any, you can do anything with it. It's a Python class that can be subclassed, you can add extra um, GUI properties that's not available through our system. You can even call a script that SCPs the file somewhere and um, runs it through SSH. So by s simply adding, changing this line, a different command is executed. A different Python file may be executed that uses the created one from GSC, and this thus allows you to add basically anything to what GSC um, generates on its own. So another great use for this that I have done is just to embed whatever flow graph falls out in a larger application and fire that up. The next thing is, um, so when I check out a project and it comes with example flow graphs, I open them up and get a bunch of missing blocks. Well, those are the higher blocks that the offer used to make a nice flow graph, which is, which is good, but it's kind of a hassle for me because I have to go through all of the GSC files, open them, generate them, reload, and iterate until I get a nice flow graph with all blocks there. So what we've done is to ease this process, have GSC auto-generate these. So you can give each flow graph a path where it looks for depending subflow graphs. And when you name them correctly, basically meaning whatever you put in the ID is actually the file name, then those will get auto-generated the first time you load up the main flow graph. Of course, and this is gonna be one of our future tasks is to actually embed the subflow graphs and then we don't have to mess with stuff like that. For now, this is a good solution, and um, you can just keep your current structure. Maybe you have all the uh, higher blocks in the same folder, or you have a subfolder for that. You just add that to the search path, and it'll auto-generate. Now, the last thing here I want to mention are the block library changes. Um, this is something that was not my idea, but I find it pretty useful. Like, if we have a lot of OOT modules installed. You might have noticed that the block library kind of gets kind of big, kind of cluttered. You don't really know what's where, and you basically only use the search to get stuff. Now what this is for is to add an extra hierarchy in the block tree, and this one is enforced. Meaning, all the blocks that come with the radio are in core, and 
all the OOT blocks are supposed to um, tell uh, in their wrappers what module they belong to. Now, they could, in theory, tell well, I belong to core as well, but it makes sense, like in this example, if I declare a module DRM, which is actually GRDRM, and all the blocks will show up in there. Um, GSC generated hard blocks default to this um, module, but you can enter any um, by using that category property. Um, one thing to notice here is the last um, top level category here is all the blocks that don't specify a module end up in here. So you'll have to update your code if you want to move out of this uh, part on the bottom and actually make it to one of the top level um, categories. The idea here is to neatly separate DRM, LTE, and whatnot uh, modules and just keep um, a bit more sanity in that tree. The syntax for this is simple square brackets. The reason for that is that we want forward and backward compatibility and the XML is kind of rigid in that way. We can't really add a, an extra attribute without breaking compatibility. That will change. Um, this brings me to the second half of this talk and this is kind of what we've been doing in the last months or maybe last half year which has not been that feature productive because we've been doing a lot of work under the hood. And it started out with refactoring work. Up, on this, up until this point, I kind of only changed as much as needed to get something done. Now this sort of mode, if that goes on for a couple of years, it kind of clutters up the code and makes it really hard to add new stuff as organically grown code tends to get really complicated at times. So what we did is we completely changed the file and inheritance structure. We now have like a core module which only contains what we need to model and kind of, um, yeah, to represent flow graphs. And then a GUI that builds on top of this to actually visualize that and um, call back into the core for edits and stuff. Um, this allows us to make GSCC, for example, really independent of the GUI. Right now, it was just like a mode would, where it wouldn't show the GUI, but actually use it, because it was so tied in together that it was not possible to separate. Um, this will also allow us to do... I started five minutes late, so this is not coming out of my time. Um, <laughs> okay, um, let me move on then. Major work has been, and this is what Jonathan's been talking about already, updating dependencies. This is stuff that most of you probably won't notice, but took up most of our time. Um, mainly is the converting of the GUI bindings, which won't make it to Python 3. Um, when I started this, I thought we'd kind of swap out uh, some imports and names and be done with it. But it turns out, over the course of the last years, GTK has also evolved, and we had lots of deprecated code that had to be updated. A good thing is, though, that we're now using Cairo for our drawings, which means we have a vector-based canvas. We can do all the nice goodies that come with it. Um, from a visual point, this is what current master looks like. This is what the GTK3 branch looks like. There's not much difference. Um, we have some maybe fancier coloring here and there, but it basically, hopefully, will look the same. It might have some new quirks because we had to touch a lot of code. And if you try and use this, and we're happy for any reports uh, on bugs and quirks, even if you could live with them. The other two parts of this uh, work were the conversion to Python 3, which is basically done. There's tooling for that, but untested since I have yet to complete the cheetahectomy. This is, Cheetah is, as you have heard, the tool we're using to generate Python code. It would be easy to swap that out if that is what all it is that we're using it for. But we're actually having it in all of the block wrappers. Like whenever you see a dollar uh, symbol in there, that's when Cheetah comes into play and that's why it's so hard to get rid of because it's in all of your um, block wrappers. Um, this will kind of force us to make a hard break here. Um, 
once we are on Python 3, we don't have Cheetah available anymore, so we can't load XML files with Cheetah in them. I've come up with a new format, and I just, in the last few minutes, want to show you off, uh, show you what the current draft for this is. Now, it's a YAML with Mako templates inside, so it's basically the same sort of hierarchy that we're doing. Um, we have still the same info that has to be uh, put in there, like parameters, ports, templates, and we also, of course, support like dynamic stuff, like hiding away parameters, supports, changing types, and whatnot. And the cool thing about YAML is that it's really, really easy to edit. You can add stuff, and all the versions won't care, and it's not as kind of verbose as some of the XML uh, tended to be. This is uh, the add const block, which I'm taking as a, uh, for an example here. And this is actually what the new kind of format will look like. Um, so we still have the ID, which is used to, of course, identify the block from GSE files. Um, you can specify parameters. And you see it's really simple, just you add a key, put a value in, and that's it. <coughs> Mako um, is actually a subset of Cheetah in, in the basic interpolation, um, where this is actually also valid Cheetah uh, code, but we're now forced to use the curly braces for our substitutions. And I've actually written a tool that kind of parses simple uh, Mako ex uh, Cheetah expressions and converts them to Mako. So my guess is that most of the like, uh, wrappers that are generated through Modtool can be converted automatically. But as soon as you do fancier templating stuff, uh, conditional stuff, looping or stuff, that will be have to convert manually. It's a one-time process, and yeah, it can't be helped. It's the only way we can move forward. Um, the other stuff I want to um, mention here is a lot of those uh, attributes here are purely um, optimal. So labels like this, if you leave them out, it'll grab the values and just use those. Um, if you leave the label out here, it'll use that. Um, if you leave out the type, it's a raw. So less info won't break stuff as it did in the XML. Um, I love feedback on this. So all of you can download the slides and have a look at this. Um, this is still the draft version, and we're trying to get this pretty tied down uh, on Friday. But if any one of you want to join the discussion, you're happy to. Um, with that, I want to conclude. We've seen a lot of changes, features, and more uh, under the hood. We always love feedback on those new features, because it's not always easy to figure out if people are actually using that, if they have maybe ideas to make it better. So positive and, of course, critic, uh, critics on that stuff are really appreciated. Um, and also, if you want to help out, we'll do a code walk on Friday. We can show you our new structure, and hopefully you'll find it intuitive enough that you'll be compelled to maybe contribute something yourself. Thank you. Oh, yeah, are there questions? Sorry. Um. We have one. I'm just curious, because you, you mentioned the new vectorized graphics thing. Yeah. Does that mean possibly, eventually, we could have control of the wire drawings and drag them where we want? Or is that a totally different? That's totally different, but um, Definitely on the plan. Um, so a lot of features that I want to have have been kind of pushed back to actually get this um, porting done, which will eventually get done. And then um, I'll have a long list of cool stuff I want to add. And this is actually among them. All right, one, one more before we uh, kick it off with Martin. Uh, yes, now that you have a list of variables, can you also find out how many times this variable is used and where exactly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
you can disable it and all the blocks go red. 